Welcome everyone to the Australian Institute of Geoscientists Queensland Branch RPG eForum series for September. Uh, today's uh, topic is petroleum uh, with Associate Professor Simon Holford and myself as host Peter Caristo. So today's talk is uh, with Associate Professor Simon Holford who's going to speak on ancient volcanic plumbing systems in sedimentary basins a guide for hydrocarbon explorers. Simon is an Associate Professor of Petroleum Geoscience at the University of Adelaide's Australian School of Petroleum and Energy Resources, where he co-leads the Stress, Structure and Seismic Research Group. Simon has published around 90 papers on prospectivity and tectonics on, of rifted margins, petroleum geomechanics and magnetism in basins. He has successfully supervised around 10 PhD students and 50 honours and master's students. He has a PhD from the University of Birmingham and a BSc honours from Keeley University. Simon has won multiple awards, including the Best Paper Prize at APIO 2012 and AEDC 2019, and the Geological Society of Australia's Walter Halchin and ES Hillis Medal. Simon was president of the South Australian Northern Territory Branch at PISA during 2015 to 2017. And now I'd like to take the opportunity to hand over to Simon. Thanks, Simon. Thank you, Peter. Okay, well, uh, thanks to AIG for inviting me to present this webinar, and hello, to those of you tuned in, I, I recognise a few uh, names in the list of participants, so hello to you and to those who I know and who don't know me. Uh, so I'm going to be sort of showcasing some of the work that we've done uh, with the University of Aberdeen and a host of industry collaborators over the past five years or so. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of my colleague Nick Schofield and uh, the PhD students uh, Neil Mark and Douglas Watson, whose projects we supervise and whose a lot of their work will feature in this presentation. So hopefully as an audience of mostly geoscientists, we can all agree that volcanoes such as Mount Etna, which is shown here. Oh, are, sorry to interrupt the, um, you need to the screens again, you've got the uh, presentation mode. Okay. That's the one. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, we can hopefully all agree that volcanoes are pretty cool, uh, but, you know, they're often quite challenging uh, to study, particularly in terms of their underlying plumbing systems. Uh, and that's going to be one of the motivations for this presentation. You know, how can we use uh, particularly uh, seismic reflection and well data to understand what's going on underneath uh, ancient volcanic uh, systems? So this slide here, we've got an image of a famous odd American central complex from Google Earth. And I've added some vertical exaggeration to accentuate the crater-like topography that's resulted from the differential weathering of the uh, arcuate, uh, gabbroic and dolerytic intrusions. And I've included this image because I want to emphasize that much of our current understanding of intrusive volcanic plumbing systems is derived from uh, either field or geochemical studies of active and volcanic environments, such as that in the previous slide, but also from studies of exhumed igneous systems in sedimentary basins. So well-known uh, basins that contain igneous rocks that have been well studied include sort of the basins in the in the Hebrides of the UK and also the Crew Basin of South Africa. And some of these models for volcanic plumbing systems, which have derived from these sort of locations, such as the you know, the ring dike and the cone sheet models, which some of the older amongst you might be able to relate from lectures on igneous geology. They're very, very old, you know, but date back about 80 years or so. However, there are fundamental uh, limitations associated with even the world's best field localities, such as, you know, poor exposure and ambiguous contacts, which restrict the amount of three dimensional information that can be obtained. So during the course of this uh, webinar, I'm going to uh, attempt to persuade you that uh, these challenges can be overcome through the study of 3D seismic reflection data sets. And so not only does such data, and here we've got an example from uh, the Bass Basin, uh, provide unique insights into the internal architecture of volcanic, uh, of ancient buried volcanoes. They also provide a much clearer sort of picture of the volcanic plumbing systems that store and transport magma in the Earth's subsurface. So in this particular example here, we've got some 3D seismic data from the Bass Basin. We can see a large vent 
several hundred meters high, but it's been fed by a large sill which is inclined to a dike. So really my aims in this webinar are to uh, hopefully to illustrate that through the analysis of seismic reflection data and complementary data sets, we now have a much deeper understanding of how volcanic plumbing systems impact the elements of process and processes of the petroleum system and are relevant to an array of hydrocarbon exploration and development issues. Uh, so here I've just got another example uh, and I've included this uh, because I was aware that uh, there might be a few folks from Queensland attending this webinar. So here is some seismic reflection data from the, the Warney Volcanic Province, which is located in the Aramanga Basin, just across the SA Queensland border. And, you know, I've just included these to show that, you know, we've got stuff that we can recognise in seismic reflection data, we can very clearly link to active volcanic systems. So on the right hand side here, we've got sort of a schematic cross section through a cinder cone and through a marge diatreme system. So a cinder cone is really the simplest type of monogenetic, monogenetic volcano. And by monogenetic, we essentially mean, you know, there's just been one eruption. And so here's our cross section. Uh, you can see lava here and actually the lava comes not from the crater, but from sort of the side of the flank. And so here's the textbook example and here's the actual data from uh, the Warney Volcanic Province and the Aramanga Basin. So we can see that the features that we observed in the seismic data are very, very similar to what we can observe in terms of active or very recently active volcanic systems. And here we've got our cross section from a mall, which is essentially a low relief, broad volcanic crater formed by sort of shallow explosive eruptions. And in the seismic data, we can see very, very similar features. And, you know, one last thing I'll mention about the Warney Volcanic Province is these volcanic rocks are Jurassic in age and we've got a mixture of uh, extrusive and intrusive igneous material. And, you know, people had recognised igneous rocks in this part of the Aramanga Basin, but, you know, people have talked about igneous rocks of Permian and Triassic and Jurassic ages. And, you know, what we were able to show in this particular study was that, you know, it was all essentially uh, a Jurassic system and we've got a mixture of extrusive and intrusive stuff. And so that's quite common in many basins, which haven't really been where people know the igneous rocks, but they've not been studied in detail. You see reports of uh, volcanic or intrusive rocks of various ages, and often they're probably similar in age, and we've just seen the extrusive and intrusive elements of them. So one of the places that we more commonly encounter uh, igneous rocks is during explorations of basins at magma rich margins, uh, such as parts of the Exmouth Plateau, where we can see here that the Triassic succession is being really heavily intruded by sills. And later on the webinar, I'll provide a more detailed case study uh, from the Exmouth sub-basin. Uh, of course, by, as by the previous slide, we can also encounter volcanism in intraplate settings, and we can also find evidence for igneous rocks and basins at so-called magma pore margins. And the Bass Basin is a really good example of this, where there are a number of large volcanoes present within the post-rift succession. In fact, the first well that was drilled in the basin, Bass 1, drilled this volcano here, which was interpreted to be a carbonate reef prior to drilling. Uh, so we'll let the explorers off in this case because this was drilled in the mid-60s. Uh, but a large number of subsequent wells in this basin have also failed to predict the presence of igneous rocks. And that's in this webinar, this is one of the themes that I'll address in a bit more detail, some of the causes and consequences of failure to identify igneous rocks uh, prior to drilling. So as this talk is about volcanic plumbing systems, I'll, I'll give a bit of a definition of what we mean by this. So quite simply, a volcanic plumbing system is a network of uh, sills, dikes and lacquer lifts that serve as uh, magma production, storage and transport channels and chambers that supply melt to volcanoes. So volcanic plumbing systems have been traditionally studied through outcrop examination of ancient exhumed systems such as the Ardner Merkin complex that I showed right at the outset of this presentation or through uh, geochemical and petrological studies of the erupted products from active volcanoes and you know these sort of studies give valuable data on the depths of magma chambers but the data are often uh, one dimensional at best and they're often dimensionless 
Now, our volcanic plumbing systems are traditionally sort of in the textbook uh, being view or viewed as being vertically stacked. So we can see here we've got models that have been proposed for the volcanic plumbing systems at Montserrat and Mount St. Helens. Uh, but there's, you know, over the last few decades, there's been a really a growing uh, body of evidence from analysis of ancient volcanic plumbing systems, image and seismic reflection data, that the sites of volcanic eruptions can potentially be significantly offset from the sites of magma production. And this appears to be the case in the Gippsland Basin. So this is uh, some work from a PhD student at the University of Adelaide who's shown that the Campanian lavas that seal uh, the, the Kipper oil and gas field are genetically related to an extensive uh, cell complex. And here's a map view here, and you can see these are the depths below the top of the trove and true horizon to a variety of intrusions that have been mapped. And when we look at this arbitrary line shown in red, and this is the data here, we can see how, you know, we can envisage how these intrusions may potentially have uh, provided a through going magmatic plumbing system supplying melt from a source uh, underneath the sort of central part of the basin up towards uh, the northern flank and essentially the basin margin. So the impacts of igneous activity on petroleum systems can be variable and relevant to both explorers and developers. So igneous activity can have detrimental sort of localised effects on source and reservoir units and I'll talk about these in a bit more detail shortly. At the basin scale they can uh, profoundly influence migration pathways and potentially create closures in their own right. Particularly in Australia and Southeast Asia there's often uh, a close link between magmatism and CO2 charge which can provide uh, challenges. Uh, but one of the exciting bits of research that we're uh, starting now is looking at the potential for CCS in basaltic sequences. So there's also potentially an opportunity of the CO2, which is often the case, is genetically related to the magnetism. Uh, and, you know, igneous rocks can also provide a number of operational challenges while drilling. And I'll provide some specific examples of this later in the presentation. So on this slide, I'm going to focus in in a bit more detail on the impacts at the source and the reservoir scale. So in this diagram here, we've got some of the expected impacts of mafic intrusions, so something like a dolerite, sill or a dike, on the properties of sandstone reservoirs and claystone source rocks. So for sandstone reservoirs, we expect some general patterns of porosity and permeability as we go away from the intrusion. So if we start away in the unaffected host rock, we might expect to see a decrease in uh, porosity and permeability as we approach the sort of the contact metamorphism zone around the intrusion. So this is going to be the part of the host rock that's been most affected by uh, conductive heating and potentially convective heating via fluids. And then we might see a relative increase in porosity and permeability towards the margin of the intrusion if there's been fracturing. And this is uh, the case, this is what we see uh, adjacent to Thick Sill, located in the UK continental shelf, where we can see porosity trends decreasing immediately uh, towards the intrusion, but immediately adjacent to the intrusion, we see a little uptick on porosity, which is most likely due to a, uh, a zone of fracturing immediately adjacent to the intrusion. In terms of clay stones, we might expect to see localised TOC reduction within the host rock adjacent to an intrusion. Uh, so this sort of pattern here, and here we've got data from a nine meter thick dike, which was intruded into marine claystones in New Mexico. And we can see when we plot uh, TOC data, uh, plotted is in terms of distance away from the intrusion, we can see a marked decrease in TOC where, you know, essentially the, the rock has been metamorphosed due to the conductive heating as the intrusion was um, placed. Intrusions that are associated with hydrotherm or fluid flow can potentially have uh, broader impacts on source and reservoir properties. So this diagram here shows a variety of paleo temperature data sets which indicate a broad sort of several hundred meter thick zone of elevated paleo temperatures around the turbidite sandstones of the Benbecula discovery in the Rockall Basin. And these thermal 
uh, value temperature effects are interpreted to reflect hydrothermal fluid flow associated with a proximal cell intrusion and uh, um, this sort of heating related to the, uh, the fluids coming away from the cell or potentially being boiled uh, by, by the cell uh, led to basically lower reservoir quality that was anticipated prior to drilling. And more broadly speaking, uh, if we're working in a basin that contains a lot of igneous rocks, uh, we should also take into account the possible presence of subsidement scale intrusions. Uh, so again, if we're working in a, a, a basin where a large amount of small intrusions are present, uh, we can run the risk of overestimating uh, the thickness of our sedimentary overburden uh, above a source rock, and that can lead to inaccurate burial history modelling. In terms of their fluid flow properties, we often assume that crystalline mafic intrusions act as barriers to subsurface uh, fluid flow, resulting in the compartmentalization of either source or reservoir uh, sections as shown in this sort of conceptual play diagram. However, sometimes intrusions such as this one here on Hout Crop in East Greenland contain, can contain significant fracture permeability. So here you can see the intrusion in dark and what you can also see is the zone of alteration around the intrusion where the, you know, the, the host rocks are basically sticking out of the cliff face. So here we've got the intrusion, here we've got the host rocks. Now in a subsurface context it might be the case that cooling related fractures within the intrusion represent a conduit for fluid migration whereas the zone around of the intrusion represents a barrier due to the reduced frosty impermeability, uh, which I referenced in a previous slide. In some cases, such as this seismic data here from the Bass Basin, it's possible to image the alteration around intrusions. So these uh, linear things here are dikes, and you can see this dike here, and you can, what we can also see is a zone of alteration around it. So this dike has gone into some coals and uh, this seismic data was acquired near to the, the Craig R1 well which was drilled by, ta by tap oil in 2010 uh, targeting uh, Eastern View coal measure sandstone reservoirs but the, the reservoirs were dry and the well completion report uh, invoked the presence of these dikes acting barriers to hydrocarbon migration from source to trap is the reason for failure of the well. Now I want to spend the next few slides of this talk by giving you a very brief beginner's guide to explain how to identify uh, volcanic plumbing systems and seismic reflection data and also to point out what some of the pitfalls uh, associated with their interpretation might be. So seismic reflections occur at the boundary between uh, rock layers with different physical properties so namely densities and compressional p wave velocities and when we encounter mafic igneous rocks and sedimentary basins, so it could be an intrusive dolerite or it could be a lava flow like a basalt. The differences in these physical properties are often very pronounced, resulting in strong acoustic impedance contrast and essentially bright reflections in seismic data. So this is highlighted here where we've got a well drilled offshore Scotland which encountered 47 meter thick dolerite sill intruded into shales. Uh, the black is the, the velocity log, the red shows density, and note that we've got big contrast when we go from the sort of homogeneous marine shales, which are the host rock, into the hard igneous intrusion. Uh, so this results in a large uh, change in acoustic impedance. Here we've got the synthetic seismograms, so we can see the red peak indicating that we've gone from soft sedimentary to hard igneous rocks. And here we've got the actual seismic data with the intrusion standing out very clearly from the, the uh, marine uh, shales into which the, uh, the dolerite was then placed. Now it's not always this straightforward to identify igneous intrusions and seismic reflection data. So this was well 205102B and this is a very close well. Uh, and this well targeted this amplitude anomaly which was interpreted to be a turbidite fan lobe. Uh, but this amplitude anomaly uh, turned out to be a false exploration target. In reality, the amplitude anomaly was a 90 meter thick uh, quartz porphyry intrusion, so essentially a granite. Uh, so even though this intrusion was about twice as thick as the dolerite sill, 
when we look at the logs, we can see, uh, you know, in the density, there's essentially no contrast between the host rocks and the intrusion. There's a bit more of a difference in terms of the velocity data. Uh, but, you know, this combines to mean that we've got less of an amplitude anomaly. So one of the take home points here is that not all igneous rocks are readily visible on seismic data, even if they're quite thick intrusions reaching about 100 meters or so. An additional example of, I, of difficulty in identifying intrusions is provided by the well Flinders 1, which was drilled in 1992 in the Bass Basin. So I mentioned at the outset that the first well, Bass 1, which was drilled in this basin, accidentally drilled a volcano. And a large number of wells in this basin, which have been subsequently drilled, have encountered igneous rocks. So we've got about over 20 wells that have got penetrations of lava flows or intrusions. But of, of these wells that have encountered igneous rocks, the vast majority of these wells failed to predict, or I should say that the, the, the people drilling the wells failed to predict the presence of igneous rocks prior to drilling. And Flinders 1 is an example of this. So this targeted this amplitude anomaly here, which was interpreted to be an Eocene fluvial reservoir sandstone. The amplitude anomaly turned out to represent a 64 meter thick dolerite intrusion, which nonetheless had a, uh, a subdued uh, seismic reflection, partly because it contained a raft of a less dense silicic material, but also because uh, there was sort of not much acoustic impedance contrast between the intrusion and the highly interbedded uh, non-marine shales and sandstones that the intrusion was emplaced into. And then finally, uh, this uh, intrusion went into a section underlying some uh, high impedance coals, and these likely acted as a transmission filter uh, masking imaging of the strata below. We also need to recognise that there's often a large volume of mafic igneous rocks that we can't image due to seismic resolution images. So if we consider the Faroe Shetland Basin offshore Scotland where we've done a lot of work, at the depths at which the majority of intrusions occur, and we're talking about two-way travel times greater than about three seconds or so, uh, intrusions have to be about 40 metres thick at least in order to be fully resolved. So on the top left hand side we've got a well that intersected multiple intrusions and here we've got the gamma ray log here and uh, they're highlighted in red and they're nicely picked up by decreases in gamma ray values. However, you know, there's only about two of these intrusions here that we would, uh, you know, say that we were able to predict or interpret on uh, seismic data confidently prior to drilling. About 60% of the intrusions in this specific well are what we would consider to be uh, seismically unresolvable or you know you would not be able to pick them as discrete reflectors in a pre-drill setting. On the bottom left we've got a frequency distribution plot here which shows the thicknesses of about 250 intrusions which have been penetrated by several dozen wells in the Faroe Shetland Basin and what we can see is that we've got a very large number of thin intrusions and a smaller number of thick intrusions and we see uh, quite similar relationships in basins such as the Karoo Basin. So going back to the Faroe Shetland Basin, we would estimate that up to about 90% of the mafic intrusions in the basin appear to be less than 40 metres thick and thus below the vertical seismic resolution and thus potentially not detectable or interpretable on seismic data uh, in a pre-drill setting. Now the inability to image or confidently interpret intrusions in a pre-drill setting can in some cases have severe ramifications. So this slide here shows a case study on drilling through unanticipated intrusions from the Faroe Shetland Basin. This was published a few months ago in AEPG Bulletin. Now evidence from core and log data from the Faroe Shetland Basin suggests that uh, many intrusions uh, contain fracture systems that are open at the present day, even when you know, you've got intrusions that are at depths of four or five kilometres uh, subsurface. Uh, and many wells have recorded significant mud losses while drilling through intrusions. Here we've got some data from well 214281, which was drilled in 1984 by ESSO. Uh, and this well encountered multiple thin intrusions that were not anticipated prior to drilling. 
So we've schematically identified them here, but the reality is it's only the thickest of this of these intrusions, so this 44 meter thick intrusion, uh, that would be really sort of interpretable in a pre-drill setting. And note how you know these intrusions seem to be linked to a, a deeper set of uh, or family of thicker intrusions, uh, which are located uh, sort of deeper within the, the main uh, deeper centre. Here we've got a drilling chart from the well showing that progress was you know relatively smooth until a series of nine intrusions were encountered at depths below 3.8 kilometres and this resulted in about 40 days of non-productive time and you know this the Faroe Shetland Basin you know is the very frontier uh, area for exploration and, and production and you know rig costs can be very expensive there so you know 40 days non-productive time is uh, is a lot of money to be spent trying to get through uh, what are quite thin intrusions so uh, you know there were a series of major issues with bit integrity getting through an upper series of intrusions here so six bits were required to drill through a 320 meter uh, section of a well that contained four intrusions including the only seismically resolvable one but the mo more severe issues were towards the base of the well where we had these intrusions here a sort of second suite of intrusions uh, and some of these intrusions led to a temporary loss of well control and in particular there were two thin intrusions which were gas charged and overpressured and one of these was about six meters thick this one here and one of them was about seven meters thick this one at the bottom and the latter the bottom intrusion led to a mate to a minor blowout and the favored explanation for this overpressure is essentially transfer of the overpressure from the deeper overpressure sequences via a network of uh, fractured interconnected intrusions so imaging of intrusions and indeed any type of geological structure can be extremely challenging when thick basaltic sequences are present within a basin. So this slide here shows the Wildcat 16471 well in the Rockall Basin and this targeted a structural closure which was interpreted to be a ramp flat anticline beneath this volcanic sequence so people thought that there was going to be about 500 meters of basalts here. Now instead of 500 meters it ended up being about 1.2 kilometers so more than twice as thick as anticipated and the instead of having nice reservoirs the upper cretaceous sequence was riddled with intrusions which again were not predicted prior to drilling so there were in fact over 70 dollarite sills within the bottom part of this well now in hindsight uh, the high impedance and the internal physical heterogeneities of the layered basaltic sequence are uh, you know is the cause of the, of the failure to you know accurately characterize the drilling target so you know the basalts led to scattering of a seismic signal uh, making imaging of a sub basaltic sequence very problematic and this structure was subsequently reinterpreted to be a force fold above a large mafic lacolith so essentially you know the host rock has accommodated the emplacement and has bulged upwards to uh to accommodate the new magma which has come in into the basin now, as a possible example of poor knowledge transfer, a near identical scenario played out in the drilling of a Ben Nevis well uh, 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 in the adjacent Faroe Shetland Basin. Uh, so here we've got, we haven't got the seismic data, but we've got the post drill assessment. Again, we can see a large lacolith which has caused folding of the overburden, and we've got all these minor intrusions sort of feeding away from the, the, the major lacolith. And so this well here. Uh, TD'd one week before the results of this well here uh, became publicly available. In basins like the Rockall Basin, which are sparsely explored and are very much still frontier basins, uh, it's likely that the existing well stock can be uh, misleading where there are lots of igneous rocks around. So in the Rockall Basin, uh, there's been one discovery out of 12 wells. And following a dry hole analysis, it was it became clear that only a small proportion of these 12 wells represented valid tests of a petroleum system. So three of the wells, including the dome prospect that I showed on the previous slide, could really be discounted because they were drilled on inadequate data. So that leaves nine wells, 
And during the dry hole analysis, it became clear that a notable proportion of these, the four wells, had been drilled on forced folds which were not recognised prior to drilling. And many of these closures have been interpreted as being hanging wall anticlines. And in basins with high densities of sill intrusions like rock also here we can see a large amount of sort of saucer shaped sills perme permeating through the basin fill. It's likely that prospects that are targeted directly overlying the sill intrusions uh, are going to be subject to little or no hydrocarbon charge. And this is potentially because the hydrocarbon is being baffled away uh, through the dense sort of network of hard uh, igneous rocks. So, uh, you know, you might be looking at your best prospectivity at the margins up dip away from the intrusive complexes. So over the past 10 years or so, we've developed a much improved understanding of intrusive systems at volcanic rifted margins and their impacts on petroleum systems. And much of this work has been derived from studies of the Faroe Shetland Basin. Although, you know, it's important to point out that no two basins are the same, even if they've got lots of igneous rocks within them. So this profile here ties the Clare oil field, which is here with the 214281 well. So that was the well that was the site of drilling issues associated with the large and small mafic intrusions. And on the interpretation, we can see a large interconnected network of mafic sills, which are Paleocene in age and which are mostly saucer shaped, as shown is in this opacity render from the flat ridge. And these intrusions have, tr have transgressed basin stratigraphy and have transported magma from basement levels through the Cretaceous succession, which is primarily shale rich and generally unstructured, through to the reservoir bearing Paleocene succession. However, it's important to note that much less is known about the emplacement of so-called seismic scale intrusions and their interactions with petroleum systems in more structurally complex, non-shale dominated basin settings. And so that leads me on to what I'm going to wrap up with, which is a case study of the Exmouth sub-basin and the intrusions that are present within this basin. So in this case study, we're looking at the southern end of the Exmouth sub-basin, which contains an extensive suite of Jurassic uh, to Cretaceous age intrusions, uh, the broad distribution of which is shown by the magenta uh, polygons on this diagram. And so in this study we used the Kubrak 3D seismic survey which was previously investigated by Ken McClay and colleagues and published in the 2013 WOBS volume, uh, but our study is more specifically focused on the structural control on intrusion morphology. So this survey images a number of large normal faults, including the Learmonth and the Rough Range uh, faults, which extend onto the uh, to onshore Western Australia. And there's one well within the survey, Herdsman One, which targeted a horse block with the Lower Cretaceous Birdrong sandstone and the Middle Jurassic Learmonth formation being the primary and secondary targets, respectively. Uh, both were encountered with good reservoir properties, but no hydrocarbons were encountered. And no intrusions were encountered in the well, uh, but on seismic data, they appeared to be within at least two kilometres away from the well location. And in the vicinity of the well, we've identified intrusions in the Yard East One well, where, where there are many intrusions, which are mostly less than 16 metre thick. And also in the Poulter One well, where there's fairly good evidence for a, a large altered intrusion. So on the left hand side here we've got a stratigraphic chart showing the main sort of units that have been affected by magmatism in this part of the Exmouth subbasin. And previous studies have indicated that the majority of magmatism occurred during the late Jurassic to early Cretaceous. And uh, mapping of these intrusions has shown that the vast majority of them terminate below and you know it's been argued by some people that they've been penny planed by these prominent lower Cretaceous unconformities. So this suggests an upper limit of Valanginian to Aptian for the intrusions in this part of the Exmouth subbasin. So here on the right hand side we've got a regional inline through the Kubrak 3D seismic data set. The pre-Jurassic strata are difficult to interpret due to the lack of well control and also due to a general reduction in seismic quality below the low Cretaceous sequence. And the structural style is dominated by a large number of steeply dipping planar domino style normal faults. 
uh, the majority of them dip towards the west, but there are smaller antithetic faults which dip towards the east. In the southern margin of the survey images the rough range and the Learmont faults which extend onshore to the, uh, the Cape Peninsula. So the Cover Act 3D covers an area of about 900 square kilometres and data was acquired down to six seconds two-way travel time. And we mapped intrusions with downward increasing uh, downward increases of acoustic impedance as blues. And within the section below the low Cretaceous unconformities where the majority of intrusions occur, the dominant frequency is about 22 hertz and the vertical, the average velocity of the sedimentary section is about three kilometers per second. Uh, and this results in a vertical resolution of about 34 meters. And this here is an example of what we would consider to be a resolvable intrusion that you can confidently map. And here we've got a detectable intrusion. So detectability is about half that of the resolvability. Uh, and note that the thickest intrusion in the nearby yard yeast one well was about 16 meters thick. So lower than the limit of sort of uh, level of detectability within this data here. So in total, we were able to map six, 26 seismically resolvable intrusions, and you can see that they're mostly uh, restricted to the northern part of the seismic reflection data. However, it's likely that there's lots more of thin intrusions that we simply can't uh, image or interpret on the seismic reflection data. So um, in undertaking our analysis of these intrusions, we wanted to uh, address the following specific questions. So what was the nature of magma input into the study area? What are the morphologies of the intrusions? How have they been influenced by the, you know, the, the normal faulting which really dominates the structural fabric of the study area? And is it possible to make any connections between the morphology of the intrusions and the lithological and the mechanical properties of the host rocks that they were emplaced into? So we, we basically categorised the 26 intrusions that we mapped into two categories based on their morphology. So we had our intrusions that are main, which are essentially sills, uh, which are saucer shaped and extend laterally throughout the basin, uh, generally strata concordant with minimal transgression except at their wings or tips. And these intrusions also exhibit uh, fault related control on their morphology. So, you know, we see these intrusions uh, uh, they are similar to the source shaped sills, uh, but where these intrusions inter intersect faults, they appear to ascend subvertically uh, via a fault plane, resulting in a shift from, say, like a sill like to a dike like morphology. And the dike like heights of these parts of the intrusions have heights of around one second two way travel time. Uh, and these intrusions here, which exploit the faults, tend to be associated with westerly dipping normal faults. So this is our uh, primary category of intrusions, the source shaped and those which are source shaped, which have, been, which have had interaction with faults. And we also observe what we term bifurcating intrusions. So these are intrusions that are characterized by dendritic bifurcating morphologies. They're highly interconnected and they consist of multiple splays which extend uh, up to one kilometer laterally across the basin and they cross cut uh, multiple horizons. And this morphology is most common in the northwest part of the study area where we've got intense vertical stacking of intrusions. And these uh, bifurcating intrusions typically found in shallower sections of the basin between around 1.5 and 2.0 seconds two-way travel time and they appear to be mostly focused within the upper Jurassic straw from this part of the basin. So let's have a look at the basin scale magma movement. And in the study area, the intrusions that we map, that we've mapped typically propagate from the west to the east. Uh, and intrusions appear to have facilitated lateral magma transport over distances uh, often exceeding 20 kilometers. And really it's only, you know, the interactions with normal faults which have limited further lateral transport of magma, but uh, have facilitated kilometer scale vertical transport. Uh, and the majority of the intrusions that we've identified are sourced from the northwest of the area. And a north northwesterly source of magmatism for this part of the Exmouth subbasin has previously been suggested uh, from the work of Max Rawlman 
who recognised a high velocity body in deep seismic reflection data in this part of the basin, which he interpreted as being potentially a mafic or ultramafic magma chamber and potentially uh, the source of the magma for these sills in dikes. Now, as previously discussed, we observe uh, sills transitioning uh, to dikes due to interactions with faults. Now, magma generally uh, propagates sub-vertically as dikes when the, the least uh, principal stress is horizontal and magma pressure exceeds the least principal stress. Uh, whilst magma propagation can also be influenced by the rheology of the host rocks and you know, mechanically weak lithology, so things like uh, mudstones or shales promoting lateral magma movement. In this study, it's clear that pre-existing structures have exerted uh, a significant influence on intrusion geometry. And again, when intrusions have interacted uh, with fault planes, they've tended to propagate along the fault planes, resulting in an inclined geometry along the fault plane. And so this is why many of the intrusions that we observe possess the characteristics of both sills and dikes. And this behavior is most commonly observed in shallow parts uh, of the basin. So the intrusions which are at deeper levels, so greater than two or three kilometers depth, uh, the intrusions typically are more likely to have sill-like geometries. Uh, we've got here an example of complex magma fault interaction resulting in what we have termed a stair-stepping morphology. Uh, and this is intrusion 13 and this intersected a series of domino star normal faults which dip towards the northwest. And so what we can see is that intrusion 13 uh, has been observed to uh, climb fault X, then move out of the fault plane into the hanging wall of fault Y, then move along fault Y and again move into the hanging wall of fault Z and then climbing up it. So importantly this observation indicates that you know it's not always the case that a single fault is going to be the dominant pathway for, uh, for emplacement and movement of the magma. And so it's possible for intrusions to develop stair-stepping morphologies by selecting multiple emplacement results uh, routes. Uh, the intrusions in, that we've observed in our study, uh, as I previously mentioned, they typically uh, exploit faults which dip towards the west, which is the direction of magma propagation. Uh, but we do observe some intrusions which uh, propagate up faults which are not perpendicular to the dominant uh, propagation direction. So here we've got a small example of this here. Uh, but these are generally small smay up displays off the major intrusions. One of the notable uh, features of the intrusions in our study area is the lack of accompanying uh, force folding of the overburden. So here we've got some seismic data just to the north of where we've been looking, drilled near the, the Toro discovery, and we can see a very clear force fold associated with a large uh, mafix or shaped sill. Again, force folding is caused by doming of the overburden as a result of the emplacement of intrusions into the host sedimentary rocks. And force folds of source shaped sills have often, often have four-way dip closures uh, and thus have been drilling targets, some of which have been successful like the tulip and gas discovery offshore Norway, some of which are unsuccessful, like the PJ dry hole in the Bass Basin. And the onlap of strata onto the paleo surface created by the force fold uh, can be used as a method of you know, indirectly dating the emplacement of intrusions when we've not got radiometric age constraints on magnetism. So whereas we do observe force folding in other parts of the Exmav subbasin, which is shown here, we don't observe uh, strong evidence for it in our particular study area and we attribute this to the intrusions commonly exploiting faults and thus negating the need for mechanical uplift and expansion of the host rocks to accommodate the sill emplacement. Now I've spent a lot of time discussing the interactions between intrusions and faults and now I'd like to pay my attention to uh, the bifurcating intrusions which have not previously been described on seismic data, although analogous features have been identified in the field. So here on the bottom part of the slide we've got examples from field studies in East Greenland in Utah which document bifurcating intrusions. And in these examples here we've had propagating magma which has encountered well-cemented homogeneous sand-rich units and then essentially the thick 
intrusion splitting into multiple splays in an attempt to seek out uh, uh, a more mechanically favorable a favorable intrusion for the magma to propagate along and ultimately for an intrusion to develop. And we suggest that similar processes may be responsible for the bifurcating intrusions that we observe in the Exmouth subbasin. So potentially uh, suggesting scale variant uh, and placement processes. We note that these bifurcating intrusions in the Exmouth subbasin dominantly occur within the middle Jurassic Learmont formation. And based on the Herdsman 1 well, uh, this stratigraphic unit is dominated by sandstones. And so, you know, the take home point is that we can potentially use intrusion, intrusion morphology to infer the host rock properties in areas of little or no well control. So I'd just like to wrap up by examining some of the implications of our findings for ex hydrocarbon exploration in the region. So the fact that the intrusions penetrated by the Yard East one well are sort of thinner than 20 metres suggests that attempts to quantify the amount and distribution of igneous material in this part of uh, the Northwest Shelf based on seismic interpretation alone are likely to produce underestimates. Uh, in addition, pervasive igneous intrusions uh, within sedimentary basins, such as is demonstrated by the Cover It 3D data set, can uh, present challenges for seismic imaging. So here we can see degradation of seismic signal beneath these intrusions here. And this is because we've got attenuation of seismic energy uh, resulting in reduced energy transmission uh, and essentially degradation of the seismic data uh, beneath igneous intrusions. So this is going to make evaluation of any sub-intrusion prospects challenging due to the poor seismic imaging. The bifurcated intrusions that we've identified in our study are likely to have a greater impact on uh, petroleum systems and, and exploration uh, in comparison to the strata and cordon or the fault controlled intrusions. Uh, and we think this is the case because you know, bifurcated intrusions are going to result in a much larger area of host rock affected by the intrusions. So this may have implications for reservoir quality and or soil shock potential. And it's also possible that you know, bifurcating igneous intrusions with multiple splays could isolate three-dimensional volumes of sedimentary rock, such as we can see here. Uh, you know, these could be reservoir units, they could be pods of soil shock, in addition to uh, you know, presenting a variety of drilling challenges, including borehole assembly, hang ups, and slow rates of penetration. So uh, I'm, I've gone a little bit longer than I expected, so I'll wrap up here with my conclusions, which are that uh, 3D seismic data sets can provide valuable insights into the transport and the placement of mafic magma in the shallow uh, crust. Uh, most volcanic and intrusive uh, bodies in sedimentary basins are below the vert level of vertical resolution and are, are, are quite difficult to predict in a pre-drill setting. Uh, Hopefully I've demonstrated that volcanic plumbing systems and rifted margin settings are not necessarily dominated by source shaped cell intrusions. We can get interactions uh, with faults, which can give us intrusions which have the characteristics of both sills and dikes. And in the case study, we've shown that intrusions of preferentially intruded normal faults as opposed to a specific lithological unit. Uh, faults that accommodate magma emplacement can preclude the development of force folds. And we've identified bifurcating intrusions uh, in the seismic data we've been working with. Uh, and these are potentially indicative of magma intrusion into brittle homogeneous sandstones. And the recognition of such intrusions can potentially enable uh, the inferences of host rock uh, physical properties beyond the well ball. So that can potentially assist both uh, prospectivity assessments and also well planning. Okay, so those are my acknowledgements. Thank you very much. I, uh, I've included my email here, so uh, if you, uh, you, know, you don't want to ask me any questions here, do feel free to follow up via email with me. Oh, thanks very much, Simon. That was a, an excellent talk, and uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. There, there are a few already popping up, so um, just to give people a chance to start uh, getting those fingers tapping furiously while we ask the first few that we've got there. 
Um, the top one on the list there is uh, from Jonas Kopping. Um, regarding stair stepping sill geometries, what could have caused the sill to move out of the fault X and propagate along the bedding instead of following the pre existing fault plane, which potentially is a weak zone? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I think thanks for that question, uh, Jonas. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, I think you're sort of potentially answering your own question there. So, you know, obviously, you know, this is an area of very little well control. So we're sort of speculating a fair bit on, on what's the uh, origin uh, of that specific uh, intrusive morphology, but potentially, you know, it could be, you know, uh, uh, some sort of rock within the hanging wall that the intrusion decides to propagate along instead of moving up the fault. So, you know, potentially we've got the combination of both, you know, uh, the structural control in combination with, you know, certain uh, rock units uh, within the the hanging walls. And so, you know, if we had the well, better well control, it'd be very interesting to see whether it was, you know, one specific uh, rock unit that uh, the intrusion kept on propagating along uh, when it was going out of the faults and into the hanging walls. Excellent, thanks Simon. Uh, next one from uh, Catherine. In areas with little or no seismic, felsic intrusions appear less obvious on petrophysical logs and can almost look like sandstones. Are there any main wireline logs that can help with felsic intrusions? The previous slide you had suggested uh, maybe sonic. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, well, maybe not obviously, it's perhaps obvious to me, but, <clears throat> uh, you, know, ob you know, there's less contrast between felsic igneous rocks and sedimentary rocks be because, you know, uh, you know, sedimentary rocks are ultimately derived, derived from, you know, felsic <laughs> igneous rocks. So, you know, sandstones probably came from granites once upon a time. Uh, so that's why you've got that less contrast in terms of physical properties. Uh, we've actually, we've got some uh, papers, so there's specifically the paper, and I'm happy to, to follow up with you specifically, but the paper uh, on the Bass Basin by Douglas Watson has got uh, what we term a, a Frankenstein log, and it's essentially like a cheat sheet for recognising the uh, the petrophysical signatures of a variety of igneous rocks, based felsic and mafic, extrusive and intrusive, uh, using well log data. So uh, I would really, uh, I'm happy to send you a link to that specific paper, and that could be a very handy. Uh, you know, if you can just pr print out one of the uh, one of the uh, figures from that and use that as a cheat sheet to try and help you uh, with the, the recognition of felsic igneous rocks. Thanks. So. Uh, to expand on that, I guess, is there so, an argument? Can I just follow up? Uh, so obviously the density is quite similar because, you know, uh, they've essentially been uh, derived, the, the felsic igneous rock has got similar petrophysical characteristics or different similar mineralogy to, to, the, to the sandstones and shales, whereas, you know, the sonic is more responding to the porosity, I would say, so. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I guess, if there's a, a more steep orientation on those felsic bodies or a you know, completely different orientation to the host rocks, uh, will they show up even though the porosities are similar? Yeah, well, I mean, that's something I didn't really get onto uh, very much, but, you know, the steeper a, uh, a feature, you know, the harder it is to, uh, you know, identify, say, in, in, in particular in seismic data. Uh, you know, some of the intrusions, the dike-like segments we saw were, uh, were quite uh, steep. Uh, but, you know, there's actually been some quite nice papers uh, imaging dikes for the first time in seismic data from, you know, that Tom Phillips at Durham and Elsa Query at Aberdeen. And that's only when you've got dikes which have gone into fault blocks, which have been subsequently rotated to lower angles, so they're easier to see the seismic reflection data. Okay, one of the joys of uh, trying to use seismic in uh, mineral exploration as well, those steep structures. Um, question from Marty, uh, you mentioned a relationship between reduction of permeability porosity and the distance to intrusions. Is there a consistent correlation between the size or thickness of these zones of reduction and the size of the intrusions? 
Also, are there graphs for sandstone and clay stones? Is there something similar for corals? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, you would expect there to be some sort of relationship between uh, the, the size of the intrusion and the, and the amount of the uh, sort of related conductive heating. Uh, so that figure is from a paper which we're hoping will be out next year. Uh, and I'm not quite sure, I do know that we do have a similar sort of diagram that we put together uh, for corals. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, if you follow up with me, I'm happy to provide you that specific figure as and when uh, you know, that paper gets published. Excellent, thanks Simon. And uh, unless uh, someone uh, quickly gets another question, final one from uh, John Menzies. Have you got any feel for the rate of development of these dikes, i.e. metres per hour? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm not really an expert uh, on that aspect of things. I do know that, uh, you know, some, <clears throat> you know, magma transport through the crust can be uh, quite rapid. I do know there is a very, uh, you know, there's been some quite uh, useful insights uh, from uh, and I'm trying to be a bit careful to get, not to get too far ahead of my schemes here, but there have been some useful insights from uh, studies of, you know, contemporary uh, volcanism or seismicity associated with active volcanoes. So I remember, I think it was El Hierro and the Canary Islands a few years ago where people were able to basically uh, show uh, migrating seismicity. And when you look at the pattern of seismicity, you know, essentially has the morphology of a, uh, you know, very similar to say like a, one of the sills or one of the lacoliths that we see on seismic data. And that was, and that specific intrusion was, or, you know, cloud of seismicity, which we think was related to the movement of magma on the subsurface was, you know, you're looking at about 10 kilometers in diameter over a matter of days. Uh, and, you know, the other uh, sort of anecdote I would point you to is that a few years ago we did a study uh, looking at uh, using both seismic reflection data and geochemical data looking at the uh, newer volcanics in South Australia so places like Mount Shank and Mount Gambia and it was clear that uh, the magma had made its way uh, from uh, from the mantle so from depths of about 100 kilometers or so in, in one of the reasons we know that is because they've got really great xenoliths uh, of prototype within them. And our, our, or the students' analysis of the uh, petrological and thermodynamic data was suggesting that essentially, you know, those xenoliths and the basalts that they were within, it made their way up from depths of about 100 kilometers or so in a matter of days. So yeah, we can get very, very rapid movement in magma. Uh, both at the crustal scale and probably also with it at the basinal scale. Excellent. Uh, well, thanks very much, Simon. It doesn't look like we've got any any more questions, and we're uh, pretty much on time there, so uh, we might call it uh, a day. Um, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the ARG, uh, a special thank you to you, Simon, for uh, presenting today, and to all the attendees, um, and also to Catherine Giuseppe who uh, helped organise this forum. And um, yeah, see you all on the 12th of October for the next AIG ALS technical meeting, which will be on uh, WKP um, Epithermal in New Zealand. Thank you all for attending. Yeah, thank you for having me. Cheers. See you all. <laughs>